Hello, and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Alicia Jones, originally from Fort Worth, Texas. I'm a junior studying cultural anthropology in the UW Madison College of Letters and Science. I also happen to work in the Badger Talks office, helping to coordinate talks hosted by organizations and businesses around the state. Today, we will be hearing from Mary Hark, UW professor of textile design and hand paper making, who will be explaining the process of hand paper making and sharing stories from her multifaceted creative practice. Originally from St. Paul, Minnesota, Mary Hark received her Bachelor of Arts from the College of St. Benedict, her Master of Arts from the University of Iowa, and her Master of Fine Arts from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She works collaboratively with fine press book designers and she designs and produces editions of hand pa handmade papers specific to particular book projects. She produces artworks intended for exhibit that make use of her handmade papers and textiles. And she brings her hand paper making practice to communities both in the US and in West Africa. Please welcome Mary Hart. Thank you, Alicia. Um, and thank you to the Badger Talks for inviting me to talk about my practice, to share my practice. Um, I have a PowerPoint that I'm going to, I think it's the easiest way on, given our, our conditions of COVID-19 to share the best images of my work. Um, so I'm gonna go through that. I'm gonna talk about how to make handmade paper about my um, studio life. Uh, I'm gonna hone in on two or three big projects that were community engaged projects. And then hopefully there'll be a few minutes for, um, for conversation. So uh, my studio is in my home and it is in a, uh, uh, a garage that used to be a two car garage and was converted into a studio. And it is filled with professional hand paper making equipment. This is a Hollander beater. My Hollander beater was, um, it's a historic beater. It, it was used as a tester beater uh, for, the, for the commercial paper industry in Appleton, Wisconsin and in its first life. And I was able to get it about 25 years ago and recondition it. And it is just a, a, a really wonderful tool. The Hollander beater is the primary tool for the Western hand paper maker. Um, the uh, Hollander beater is, I'm gonna uh, whip through a few images here of the studio. Um, the Hollander beater, uh, here are, I actually have two of them. Um, the Hollander takes a raw material uh, you can make paper out of any cellulose or bast material. So I use flax, which is the uh, plant that linen cloth comes from. I use linen cloth and cotton cloth, sometimes abaca, um, and sometimes um, cotton, uh, cotton that's been partially processed by four paper makers. And I put that raw material into the Hollander beater. Let me back up a second. You can see in the front with water and there's a roll. The roll, I'm not sure if you can see my my cursor, but there's a roll in here and a bed plate. And what happens is as time goes by, you limit the amount of, of space between the roll and the bed plate and the material becomes hydrated and macerated. And the longer it's in the beater, the physical qualities of the paper change. So paper is really made in the handmade, in, in, in the Hollander beater. Um, I make my primary uh, uh, mold and decal, which is the tool that captures the uh, pulp is 18 by 24 inches. So that's the that that's the size of most of the sheets that I produce. And I am super interested in color and in tactile qualities of the paper. Um, and so uh, I'm often called upon to make papers for covers or for uh, end sheets in a book. These are four colors of linen cloth that um, were cut because I wanted to produce a warm a warm, uh, uh, a warm white. So they're cut about the size of a quarter before they went into the Hollander beater. The Hollander be they were in the Hollander beater for about an hour or an hour and a half. And then they went into a vat with water. And this is my mold and decal, which is a screen that captures the pulp. Um, and you have to manipulate it in a special way so that all those fibers become nice and smooth and even, and your sheet is nice and smooth and even for printing. Um, and there is the result of that paper uh, that of those four colors of linen cloth that was for a book project, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later in the slideshow. So these are just images of the kinds of things I love to do. I love finding 
um, beautiful surfaces, and I am frequently um, called upon to make between 200 and 700 sheets for a particular book project. And then I end up having leftovers from that um, enterprise, and I use that in collage and in the artworks that hang on the wall. And sometimes people come and want to buy one or two sheets for a special project. Here's another example of a uh, a bunch of, of linen cloth that are in um, colors that are going to, in the end, turn into a, ro a, a red sheet. So uh, as, a, as a participant in a book arts project, I would be called upon, um, sometimes I might make my own book and then I would design the book and I would fabricate all the parts. But more likely, I'm called upon as the paper maker. And this is an example from the Minnesota Center for Book Arts, which um, used to put out a winter book every year with a regional writer and I was called upon to make the paper for the cover and for the book for the for the end sheets and this particular volume was regional poetry and so I chose to make paper out of local botanicals that was found in in my in my garden these are daylilies and hosta and they have a sense of place which I hoped would um, permeate the project and support the content of the book um, uh, these are other examples of uh, book projects that I've been on Emily Martin from Iowa City um, this is Jan Owen a calligrapher from Maine and she um, I'm always thrilled when she chooses my paper because her calligraphy is so beautiful. Um, but the, the, the paper becomes in, in her books, a kind of painting, a kind of atmospheric substrat that um, contributes to the overall ambiance of the viewer's experience. Um, these are all uh, images from the inside of that, of that book. Um, an example of a collaborative book would be this, uh, this volume, which was commissioned by the Renwick Gallery in Washington, DC um, through uh, through uh, Haystack College, Haystack School of Art in Maine. So Stuart Kestenbaum is a poet. Su Susan Webster is a printer. And I was the paper maker and the book designer. So I would design the book, made the paper, sent the sheets to um, Susan who printed all the sheets with, with the poem that, uh, that Stuart had written. And then those sheets were sent back to me in the Midwest and I put them together into this accordion fold volume and um, then built a clamshell box covered in handmade paper for the volume to be held and saved in. Um, so then I also make things that are like paintings that hang on the wall. I call them constructed paintings. This is about eight inches square. It's dyed with indigo dye. It has um, linen cloth and flax paper, flax and linen papers. and. Um, these are made from scraps that are often left over from book projects and what sometimes I'm making paper specific to a project. Um, these, these images are from a series called Close to Home and the, the series abstractly was um, referencing the experience of my domestic life of mending and patching and cleaning and um, the sort of mess and beauty of, of, of my domestic life. Um, those pieces were quite small. You can tell by the stitches. This is a really large curtain-like piece from that series. It's about 10 feet high and 15 feet wide and hangs on the wall in an arc so that it's about 10 inches from the wall in the middle. Um, here's a detail of that piece. I use a lot of stitches, um, both structurally. It uh, holds together all this patchwork of paper and cloth, but I also use the stitches as a uh, as a drawing mark, a drawing mark that is close to the surface, a drawing mark that is referencing my hand, um, a drawing mark that might be about suture or it might be about mending. So in um, about 11 years ago, I uh, applied for a Fulbright grant and was given um, a year's work, a, a chance to live for a year in Sub-Saharan Africa. I chose to go to Sub-Saharan Africa because my study of textiles was highly influenced by the indigo dye tradition of West Africa, but also it is a hot spot on the world for textiles. And it is a place where textiles are deeply embedded in the culture and um, people understand them. 
they read them, they use them for political celebration, for, uh, for personal celebrations. And I wanted to be in a play as a textile artist, as an artist whose practice was deeply invested in textile traditions. I wanted to be in a place where textiles were um, deeply understood and integrated into, um, into life. Uh, so these are some images. I, I landed in Ghana, uh, which is, um, I landed in Ghana and I spent a year uh, hanging out with traditional makers, uh, with cloth vendors um, in the markets. Um, and at a certain point, I decided I wanted to um, go to the university and um, meet my peers and perhaps work with my peers, university trained artists. Now, my job as an artist researcher, I felt was to be fully present, to take everything in and then to respond to it as best I could with a body of work. Um, these are all images of the rich um, and vibrant cloth tradition of Ghana. Um, I spent a lot of time studying the Adinkra tradition and lived with the family um, who is the patriarch. And then I decided to go to the university and I, sa and I said, look, I don't have to, um, I I I'm not here to teach a full semester's course, but I could run a workshop and here are some of my areas of expertise. And I ended up teaching a, or facilitating a graduate uh, level a seminar on contemporary art in which I learned as much as I shared for sure. And then I taught, a, I ran a six week workshop for third year printmakers and those um, to, to a papermaking workshop. So I, at the time had um, been teaching at McAllister College in St. Paul and those, my students at McAllister brought a few, uh, helped me to gather and they helped me to construct a few pieces of equipment to carry with me, but mostly I, um, we, we jerry-rigged equipment and built it and found things that we could, um, that, that were from the local kitchens and from local cooking traditions that we could uh, use in our, our uh, exploration of handmade paper. At that time, 11 years ago, getting a good paper um, for a printmaking student, it was hard to find. It had to be imported from Europe or Asia and it was expensive. So to make a sheet of paper that would have the integrity for printmaking or for sculpture or for an artful um, experience, that was our goal. And it's a, it's a rainforest. So what is available is um, in this botanical garden that was the campus of KNUST in Kumasi, Ghana, um, were so many plants. We divided the group of students into pairs and we started cooking the plantain and the cashew and the, the, the maize, all, all the local plants that we could gather, we would beat them by hand in this mortar and pestle, traditionally used, uh, used in kitchens contemporarily and traditionally to make fufu and other, um, uh, other uh, uh, popular dishes. Um, and then we had a few pieces of equipment that my McAllister crew had sent along with me. And um, we made some um, really beautiful papers. The students were like over the moon with the activity. No one had ever done this before um, with the current students that were there. There were like 60 students. We had to carry water to our studio. There was intermittent electricity. It was a modest um, uh, situation that we worked in, but the students worked day and night. And we came up with papers that were pretty wonderful, but um, just using the local botanicals, they didn't have the integrity that was probably necessary to have the strength, um, the durability, the qualities necessary to be a good um, sustainable art um, material. Um, I had brought with me, uh, Mr. Fulbright lets you bring lots of boxes of research materials. And um, I had brought with me a box of mulberry fiber called Kozo that came from Japan. And this is material that has made rice paper. You might know it as rice paper, a thin, strong, elegant paper. Uh, very, very uh, important um, fiber in the world of hand paper making. And I knew that I could process that without a Hollander beater. I could process it by beating it by hand. And so I brought my box of Kozo out and we started adding it to the local botanicals and exponentially our sheets improved because these long fibers of that Kozo, that mulberry fiber, um, while it, it allowed us to retain the color and the tactile qualities that were so specific to that plant and to place, 
um, it, it, it gave the paper um, strength. Um, well, this, um, we thought we have to keep this going when this is over. So I went to the, on campus to the Forestry Commission, which is like the DNR for us. And I showed them the Kozo fiber, the mulberry fiber. And I said, you know, what do we have in Ghana, which has these qualities? These are the qualities we need for a good sheet of paper. And um, they pulled out these posters. Danger, Pope Mulberry, if you see this plant, burn it, call us. And I was like, what, what? And uh, it turned out that in 1969, the president of Ghana had sent, or the president, someone in the government had sent um, to China for 14 pulp mulberry plants with the idea of investigating a cottage industry of paper making in Ghana. And immediately after that, there was, um, you know, uh, there was a coup, there was a civil unrest and, uh, um, and, and there were also droughts and the whole project um, got lost in the mix. But those 14 plants were planted in a forest preserve right outside of Kumasi, where I was stationed. And um, over, after you know, they were planted, they languished, and then the, there were droughts. And then there was a forest fire that um, occurred because of the droughts. And when the forest canopy was raised by the fire, those 14 plants started to thrive. And they are now the most insidious non-indigenous plant in the central forest region of Ghana. Uh, they're actually now in six different regions of Ghana. This is the very plant that made the most beautiful paper in the history of the world. And I was like, what? And so the following year, I joined the faculty in Madison, big research university, and I knew what I wanted to do. Um, and I was funded by the graduate school and by Christmas time of my first year, I was back starting this project. So this paper is made from the inner bark of these mulberry trees. We have mulberry in rural Wisconsin. My students go out, my, it, it, currently I have, a, I have students um, harvesting uh, mulberry in Wisconsin, local mulberry. It's not quite as uh, robust as this, um, but the, the, the material is harvested, the inner bark, it's it, the outer bark is cleaned, it's cooked in a soda ash, a caustic agent, and then it's beaten by hand or else in a Hollander beater. And over the course of that, of the last 11 years, I've been building a project there, which um, we hope soon will be a standalone bricks and mortar um, situation that's employing people. But to begin with, we didn't want to, as our paper started to improve with um, the input of a group of interested graduate students, art educators, horticulturalists, um, just enthusiasts. Um, we were able to uh, work at improving the papers, but we decided we didn't wanna be an NGO. We didn't wanna be, at least at the beginning, we wanted to see what can we do with this paper? Can we make a culturally interesting, beautiful, relevant contribution um, as artists before we decide to become a business where we have to worry about the bottom line. So I teamed up with Atakwami and his wife and artistic partner, Pamela Clarkson, two very important Ghanaian artists, and um, who had at the time the only print, uh, intaglio print shop in Ghana. And we decided to make an artist book um, focused, the content of the book would be focused on Konimo, also a friend of, of ours from, from um, that, uh, that area in Kumasi, but a, a declared national living treasure for his work with traditional music. And again, with support from UW-Madison, I was able to bring in uh, Ben Mandelson, who had recorded most of the really important musicians on the African continent, and we were able to make a field recording with Konimo and his group that would be included in our artist book. So an artist book can be quite um, expansive in what's, um, in, in what's presented. This, I always love to see this. This is our quality control because we were working in an open air studio with taxis and people with megaphones declaring the concern about the afterlife and, and uh, all, uh, chickens, uh, you know, and roosters crowing were all part of the ambiance, but we asked people to be careful before they came in when we were, when we were recording. And so meanwhile, while recording was taking place, Pamela and Atta were doing some quality control white paper that I showed you at the beginning of the talk um, and set to work um, printing 
uh, images that were that they designed that were a reflection on the content of Kony Mo's music as well as local architecture and textiles. And then when that was finished, we set up on the campus. We were given a beautiful, um, uh, this is a textile studio with wonderful airflow and water to um, produce papers with the local materials that would be used as the substrate to hold the content for the book. And these are just images. I carried all those papers back to Madison where I had a group of graduate students that helped me to um, proceed with the book. So I'm going to show you some um, images here of the book in progress. It's a 12 by 12 um, inch clamshell box that holds, there were 50 of them, and it holds this content, which is there to show off the paper as much as anything. Um, it includes lyrics from a book that has evidence of Kony Mo's own handwriting. The book was uh, printed in Twi and in English. Twi is the local language. And we had a Twi scholar, a graduate student from Ghana, as part of the African Cultural Studies program at the time. And he helped us edit and make sure that we were, um, that we were uh, correct with the language. We had the CD that also had uh, images of the, uh, of the, of the um, recording um, embedded on it. And then the icing on the cake were these beautiful uh, intaglio prints produced by Pamela and Atta. And our final book, um, our final, the, the, the book Once Complete is now in um, uh, something like 15 major collections around the world. It's at the Met Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's in the Smithsonian. It's in an important collection in South Africa. And so we were to able to take this insidious non-indigenous plant that is a uh, weed growing out of control, creating trouble for farmers and show that we could, we could make a culturally, um, we could make a cultural contribution. It could become a culturally important um, uh, part of uh, of our activity. So at that point, um, the, it was the next phase of the project. And um, what we're doing now is, first of all, trying to train lots of people. The group of supporters is quite international. Um, we, I work with graduate students in art education um, who are learning uh, art educators in Ghana, just like everywhere else, uh, art, art is required and yet unfunded. So uh, uh, this is fundamentally a free material. Um, I've been working with a training subsistence farmers in um, rural Kumasi where this stuff is growing out of control to identify the uh, plants and to harvest them and partially process them for us so that I can uh, call ahead and say, I need 200 pounds of, of fiber and then I come with my scale and uh, we do some quality control and I'm able to um, pay more than local wages for that labor. Um, and I've done tons of teaching. These are design students from a, a polytechnic in Northern Ghana at Bogotanga, um, learning to make that, um, to make paper. And our papers along the way just become more and more interesting. Um, several students have come uh, this, this, these are design students from um, the university there who have now visited uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, but here, these are just uh, images from the life. We were able to get a Hollander beater, pretty much like the one I showed you at the beginning of the show, at the beginning of the slideshow, um, donated by an artist, of, or we paid a small amount, shipped it in to Ghana, um, and have done oodles of training for artists, for um, uh, graphic designers for educators. And now what we're trying to do, the push is to try to make a bricks and mortar business where we can hire and where we can train and hire 10, a minimum of 10 people um, and perhaps more to go into production. So we are looking for products uh, to, to become a self-sustaining um, operation. First of all, products that might be relevant for the Ghanaian market. Um, these are just more images of the paper <laughs> kind of flying through here. So our high-end products include things like these folding screens. The designs on the folding screens are riffing off of traditional textile patterns, and they're being produced by um, this team of iron workers who is a very high-level craftsman, and they're mainly 
in their other life making burglar bars and gates and things like that and um but fabricating these beautiful um objects that then we're backing with the handmade paper and we see these as a potent our potential market uh being uh, public spaces such as hotel lobbies high-end residences etc there's money in ghana it's just not well distributed um and uh, and also we just think they're stunningly beautiful. I will immodestly say, um, but these are all examples: lights, uh, tables that are covered also with glass, but that have that texture underneath. Um, these are also and and um, so now I'm going to go a little bit into our process in Ghana. Ghana is, as I've mentioned, a textile hotspot on the world, and there is lots of um, production of clothing. We're able to gather free um textiles from seamstresses and um use it along with the pulp mulberry we use the color from the textiles to color our paper so we're not using any um unnecessary chemicals this is my research assistant in ghana his name is henry obeng and um henry was my assistant for three years and he is now in his second year as an mfa candidate in design studies and he came, he was able to come to our program to uh, fine tune his uh, understanding of paper and um, receive that um, terminal degree in the art in the arts. These are more examples of products that we produce this for UW Madison for the cultural studies conference a few years ago. But this we think is going to be our cash cow. This is, these are paper bags and just like everywhere in the world, we're trying to get rid of that polyurethane bag that is ubiquitous in Ghana. And um, paper bags are more and more entering the marketplace. Our papers are strong, and we think this is a market that would help us to generate um, income and be able to employ people. Uh, just a few other things. Spun paper in a culture where people love cloth and understand textile structure. Um, paper uh, handbags, fashion. I'm from the textile and fashion design program on UW-Madison campus. And so my, some of my fashion students designed bags, which I then using the paper and cloth from Ghana, those bags were brought back to Ghana and then uh, critiqued by Ghanaians, fine tuned. And then I worked with a leather worker to um, create these beautiful handbags and computer bags uh, and, and a, a, a ubiquitous accessory in Ghana is the fan, which um, uh, you see here. And here's a beautiful model with one of our paper fans. Um, so um, jumping quickly to a project, there's more to say about the Ghana project, but I want to jump quickly to the idea of um, working with my communities here in the Midwest. And this happened a few years ago in um, St. Paul, Minnesota, in a neighborhood called Frogtown, which is a neighborhood that's always been a home to new immigrants and currently is a home to many people from um, Laos and Thailand, uh, Mexico, uh, Somalia, and, and, and generally a low income population in, in this neighborhood. And um, the artist Setu Jones, who's a very important regional artist and national artist, um, lives in Frogtown and um, decided, had the idea, the vision to create a community meal and invite 2000 people to sit down and eat um, local food. And he, he's very interested in food security. He's very interested in social engaged artwork. He's very interested in building community. And so he imagined and got funding for this massive um, table. And he asked me to participate. And first he said, would you make paper plates? And I said, no, I'm not gonna make paper plates, but I will make placemats and I need a team. And I would be able to pay my team a good wage. And so I was able to hire four people from the neighborhood, a very diverse team in terms of um, country of origin and age, and we, I was able to train them to become excellent paper makers. Here's a picture of the final table, 2000 people at a half mile table with our placemats. But um, our my team um, learned to become good paper makers and um, we set up in driveways and on, um, and on, uh, 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 on the boulevards where we would get permission from homeowners to give us a garden hose. And these, um, these assistants uh, uh, taught hundreds of people how to make a sheet of paper. And they, they were very good teachers and they were also very fine paper makers. Um, we took this show on the road 
and so we're able to get equipment that was run by a bicycle. Everything was portable. The people in this neighborhood who are very busy um, learning English, earning a living, um, may not feel welcome at some of the arts organizations that are, um, you know, that where where I might go and teach a workshop, perhaps. Um, we just said they they're walking to and from the bus, and they stop and they make a sheet of paper and they talk about paper and they talk about the machine and um, it was fabulous. I mean, it was really fun and people, people loved it and, um, and, and had a really fabulous engagement in the participation and just about every kind of person you could imagine um, in a, such a wonderfully diverse neighborhood uh, made a sheet. And in the end, we had 2,400 sheets of paper and that is no small thing. That is no small thing. Um, here we are counting and sorting and setting the table on a September, mid-September morning um, where it didn't rain, it, they didn't blow away. 300 people helped to set the table. The food was choreographed by a dancer and delivered every two weeks, all locally produced food. Um, the thing was just a, a fabulous experience for everyone involved. And I was concerned that all those placemats would uh, go in the trash. And so I had my team ready to run and collect those placemats so we could potentially use them in an artist book. But let me tell you, 2000 people walked away carrying a placemat. And that was a pretty wonderful thing to see. Um, another project I've been engaged in in Wisconsin, we had got some money from the government, the, uh, uh, for, from the government to, um, to investigate uh, small scale linen farming so we worked with some organic farmers in the western, um, on the western edge of Wisconsin, uh, people that have rotation, rotating crops. And our question was, um, could, uh, could flax production be reintegrated into the, um, into the agricultural uh, economy of, of Wisconsin and, and how might that work? And so we planted different kinds of cotton, I mean, different kinds of, of flax and here is a beautiful picture of our field um, and uh, the, the, the flax plant in bloom. And this is my partner, Andrea Micklebust, um, who is a fiber artist, a weaver, a shepherd, uh, and, um, and a public artist. In fact, she has three public works um, on the campus, including one in front of microbiology, which I see all the time because it's near the Sohi building. Um, and there I am, I came on board as the paper maker. So there, there is the paper um, that, the, that was made from the flax, uh, processed in different ways. Andrea was interested in the thread and in its potential to be woven. Um, but the process of taking the raw material and turning it into a fiber that you can spin and weave with or you can make paper with is very laborious. And we discovered we, um, we, we discovered a colleague in Nova Scotia, an organic farmer who was interested in flax production. And she worked with scientists, with engineers to develop the only affordable small scale linen production machinery that exists in the world. Most of this machinery is million dollar machinery that fills a giant warehouse. Um, and we took our flax from our, our fields, our 500 pounds of flax and pushed it in the back of a, of a little Ford truck and uh, drove it across the border. It took a few hours to convince the um, officials at the border that we should be able to do that. Um, and um, here we are processing our flax. And um, very quickly, these are some, this is some of the results. We ran a paper making workshop. Um, another uh, uh, project quickly that is now in a public library. Um, this is uh, worked on with groups of, of, of kids and neighbors in that same neighborhood in St. Paul. Um, and this one of the leaders of this was one of the kids that was um, hired for the, pro the Create the Community Meal project. Um, so we created a whole bunch of patterns that were put onto these book forms. It was just installed before everything shut down for COVID. And so I don't have any images of it being shut down. But I wanted to show this picture of Tony um, as the lead on this project in my studio. He was um, 
uh, he was a high, uh, senior in high school when he helped on that create the community meal project. And now he has graduated with an art degree from the University of Minnesota and has a fellowship at a major at Penland School of Art, which is a major craft program in the US. Um, and these are images of um, the production of some of those papers and of those book objects that are um, that populate a shelf in the library, but we haven't been able to get in to properly photograph it. Um, I work on public artwork pieces. This is a commission for a university in Minnesota where the, um, the uh, largest population of new immigrants. And so I was able to capture text <coughs> from many of the um, students and incorporate that into the piece. And then um, images going back to my own private studio work of, um, of the fields in, in Wisconsin, of the land organization of Wisconsin, often at the end of the day when I'm finished teaching and I'm in my car and I'm driving in rural areas and the light is as it, it is and the fields are organized such as they are and um, often in winter when um, there's also snow and and uh, a, a particular ambiance. And these are the things that um, influence these works. Uh, these, this body of work is titled um, Driftless Reverie. And um, they are really about the landscape of Wisconsin, but I think as much about, uh, they are as much about my love of paper and the, tac the, the tactile nature of these surfaces and the colors and the weights and the material qualities that this paper has. Um, and always, I've got, um, as always, I've got uh, handmade paper uh, in production for projects. And I'm just really quickly going to end um, with an image of, uh, of a colleague that is um, from the horticulture department. And she's leading a group or is part of a group that is investigating the potential for hemp, uh, commercial hemp production in Wisconsin. And she invited me um, very recently to um, make paper from, from the hemp that they're growing. And um, right behind me, I'm not sure if you can see it, uh, but on the table there is um, uh, some of the raw hemp that I've been beginning to process. I don't have any paper yet to show you uh, because it's uh, not quite hot off the press yet but it's my, one of my current um, projects. So I'm gonna um, just back up a little bit and end right, oh, here we go. These are images of the, these are images of the hemp. And then I'm gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna stop right there because I think I, I might've gone longer than I should have, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, um, that's me, Mary Hark, that's a snapshot of really race through, um, a complicated practice. Uh, I, I guess at the very end here, I want to give credit to my teacher, my hand paper making teacher, who is Tim Barrett from the University of Iowa Center for the Book, where I began as a hand paper maker. And um, he retired last year from his uh, work as the director. And um, I think uh, acknowledging our teachers is, is an important thing. And he really gave me a life uh, a life with these materials. So thank you so much. I, I need a little guidance here from my minders if I should uh, stop screen sharing and um, maybe take some questions. Yes? Okay. Okay. Shall I stop screen sharing? Hello everyone, Fran Paleo Moyer here, your Badger Talks producer. And Mary, thank you so much for such an entertaining presentation. The, the colors, the textures. Wow, I think you you lost your audience here and the beauty of a lot of the great imagery that you were sharing there. Um, we do have a few questions uh, that I'll pass along to you. So uh, Claudia Curran Broman is asking, is this- Oh, thank you. I see it. I see these now. Yeah, good. Oh, you do. Okay, great. Well, would you like me to share them with you or? Yeah, would you do that? That'd be helpful. Sure. So is this flax available still or being grown? She's a spinner weaver. 
Um, yeah, this was a standalone project right now, but I would recommend, um, and my colleague, Andrea Michelbust has moved her um, operation to Vermont. Um, but the, our, our colleague, um, Patricia Bishop at Taproot Farms is absolutely in production. And if you look up Taproot Labs, T-A-P-R-O-O-T, -O -O Taproot Labs, or Taproot Farm, you'll find her operation. And um, so we're not, we don't have uh, anything to sell, but we did um, show that it was a viable possibility. And, um, and I think it's something that can, will happen in the future, but I would recommend contacting Patricia Bishop. She's got this project called From Seed to Cloth where she's, and, and in this, she's hired young designers from the Nova Scotia School of Art and they're growing the flax, they're processing the flax, they're making the yarns, they're weaving the fabric, they're designing cloth, they're selling the garments. It's really cool. Fantastic, thank you, Mary. Another question from Nancy McCulley, which hi, Nancy, I know Nancy. Uh, the products from Ghana are beautiful. Are they commercially available in the US? The bags are commercially available um, right now through me um, and you know, our goal, we were right, our, our first goal was to address the Ghanaian market first. Um, and we were right on the precipice of something and everything shut down in Mar I mean, I literally was in Ghana when, Ga when the UW shut down. And um, we've lost a lot of uh, momentum. You know, we were right on the verge of, we wanted Ghanaian funding, you know, like the idea was to have this be homegrown first, rather than be somebody swooping in from the outside and, um, and, and then making something there for people on the outside. But um, the, you know, obviously the international market is something we wanna participate in as well. Um, the bags are easy to carry. The screens, which I, I mean, I covet them. I would love to have one, you know, figuring out how to ship them and make it cost effective. Um, but if anyone is interested in the paper bags, the, the handbags, those kinds of things, I've got a website called uh, ghanapaperproject.com and you can reach me through that or you can reach me through my UW email. Excellent. Um, another question here, what textile fibers are being used in Ghana for these things? Um, well, the cloth we're purchasing from local makers. So anything and the cloth that we're beating up um, into pulp, we're taking from the floors of local seamstresses. And there are many, many, many all over the place, lots of seamstresses. Um, the fiber is the Ghanaian pulp mulberry that I talked about. So it's both cotton fiber and um, that's cotton waste that, that would end up in landfill. And, um, and this uh, indigenous, uh, this non-indigenous plant, the pulp mulberry. Um, relating to that, uh, <laughs> we're wondering the scientific name of the mulberry. Do you happen to know? Yes, that would be a really good question, which I can imagine the name in my, my, in my head, but I'm not gonna say it because I'll, I'll butcher it. However- and Specifically, is there a name of the mulberry that works yes. in our region? Um, it's all, I think it's all the same family. Um, it's not the mulberry, in our region, it's not the mulberry tree. It's the mulberry bush that grows along the edges of fields. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, uh, it, I take my students into, into a, to a particular um, place outside of Madison every year where we work with a naturalist and harvest it. it, it it's even in the alleys of, of, of Madison. I just had a student harvest it at the, at the uh, Arboretum with, with permission. The Arboretum has it. It, it grows like a weed. It, it, mm. It's hard to contain. Um, and so someone that wanted to find it, they might start by going to the Arboretum and ask, could I have some? That's just what my student did and she got plenty. And then um, if somebody needed information about how to process that, they could just reach out to me. So Mary, it looks like the work that you're doing in a lot of these uh, other countries are really stimulating the economy. Have you been tracking that at all in terms of the economic impact of well, the I think it is nothing but potential to, to, to contribute to the economy. Um, 
I'm not sure that we have arrived there yet. You know, most of what I've done has been supported by grants either from UW or private foundations. Um, the potential is really there. And it's like this bridge, like we've got this quality product and it is really a high quality product. And we're right at the precipice of a bridge. And then there's this little bridge. And on the other side is successful business venture. And I got us to that bridge, you know, and I'm an artist and I can think about, oh yeah, let's do this. But when I have to sit down with a spreadsheet and a business plan, um, I get really nervous. Um, I've gotten some good help from the business school uh, here. And we've come really close to, I mean, we have come a hair's breadth away from the kind of funding we need to be able to say, okay, we're gonna do this for five years. I can hire you, I can train you, I can pay you to come to work. Until I have the money to get to pay somebody to come to work, I can't ask people to volunteer. So everything we've done has been paid for by grants I've written, small grants with a thrifty uh, PI. And, um, uh, but what we need is like a, you know, we need $150,000 or something like this. You know, that's not even, that isn't very much in the scheme of things. And we literally have been a finalist three times, like a hair's breadth, right? From that kind of funding, which would allow me to say, okay, I'm going to train, I'm going to train paper makers. I'm going to train managers. I'm going to train, I'm going to bring on Ghanaian designers. We're going to commit to two years. And during those two years, we're going to um, make friends with the business sector who can take our product. And um, I guess I've been really committed to this idea of uh, building it from the ground up in Ghana for Ghanaians with the dream of walking away and leaving it in Ghanaian hands. It's, you know, and the other model is for somebody to come in at, um, and say, I'm from Madison and I'm, I've, I'm going to hire you to make these things. And then I'm going to bring it back to my um, well-heeled friends in Madison and in the U S but I'm kind of, I'm interested in the other thing first, because I think the tendency for a kind of colonial attitude toward building a project is really great when you're just hiring people, you know? And so the idea is I have this knowledge. I'm trying to share it with people who are interested and have you know, the skill and ability to, and then where will they take it, right? Rather than saying, I would like to come in and have you do these things to suit my vision and you will earn an income and that will be an improved quality of life. But, um, but it's kind of tied to me and my vision and that's limited. That's so limited. And that's Thank that you. lens is so much, Mary. We're, we're very lucky to be inspired by artists like you and, certainly understand, you know, the business aspect of it is a whole nother story, right? But the art, the art part is the, the creation and the inspiration. And we're just so lucky to have artists like you, not only on our campus, but sharing your craft around the world. So thanks so much. Thank you, Fran. Yeah, great. So um, thanks for tuning in this week, everyone. And uh, again, we've just been so lucky to, to get a glimpse into one of our faculty or staff members lives on the UW-Madison campus. Um, and next week, uh, we're gonna be having Professor John, or Jack as we all call him, Williams, who is the professor in the Department of Geography and also a faculty affiliate with the, with the Center for Climatic Research. And he's gonna be talking about climate change, an important topic for all of us um, and ecosystems. Jack specifically um, talks about plant species um, and their relation to past and future climate change. So it's sure to be an interesting talk. Um, so that's next Tuesday, October 27th at noon. As always, I'm seeking feedback for topics on Badger Talks. Um, go to badgertalks.wist.edu to see the full schedule of upcoming weekly talks. And thanks again for tuning in, everybody. Take care. <laughs>